This is Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. Glad that you could join me on this brand new edition of New Life Program. I'm your host, Tileno Diang. The last time Pastor Kigundu Ndiga talked to us, he was winding up on his two-part series on adultery of the mind. Today, he has something new, but not much different from the last time's topic. Make sure you do not miss out on it. Later on, Steve Rundu will share with us about giving and God's presence. We also have great music in store for you, so keep it the voice of hope. Listener, I hope you are enjoying the show. Let us welcome Pastor Kigundu Ndiga to educate us more on the topic Changing the Sexually Abusive Mind. Be enlightened. Dear listener, we want to welcome you to our series, The Abandoned Life, which is based on John 10, verse 10, where Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am convinced that this abandoned life includes even the area of our marriage. The topic today, dear listener, is changing the sexually abusive mind. After our last series, Adultery of the Mind, we received the following note which we would like to answer for all to hear. This is what the person wrote. This is sobering stuff. It would be even better in future broadcasts to talk on how to get out of sexual sin. It would help those who are acutely aware of the sinfulness of pornography and are desperately trying to escape this sinful behavior without much success. And so, dear listener, we pray these messages will bring help and hope. The downward spiral in justifying and mixing a person's standard with their own happens in the same way as with any addictive behavior. The first time someone gives in to addicting behavior, a door opens to the next time and the next and the next. And each time some type of mind shift is involved, in order to justify this type of cheating. Or the friend Stoika, who has written a book every man's battle and who was once caught up within the snares of pornography, puts it in this way. He says, We aren't victims of some vast conspiracy to ensnare us sexually. We have simply chosen to mix in our own standards of sexual conduct with God's standard. 
Since we found God's standard too difficult, we created a mixture, something new, something comfortable, and something mediocre. Now, what do we mean by mixture? Perhaps a good example is the muddled definition of sexual relations that surfaced in the sex scandal involving a former U.S. president. After the president stated under oath that he did not have sexual relations with a certain woman, he later explained that he didn't view oral sex as being in that category. So by that definition, he hadn't committed adultery. Dear listener, that represents quite a contrast to the standard Christ taught. In Matthew 5, verse 28, when he says, But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So these marriage messages are meant to be a starting place to hopefully inspire people to get help. It's like what author Gary Thomas says, While how-to marriage books and seminars certainly have their value and place, on their own they miss the key issue. It's not really about how to far more often. It's about whether we have the heart to. We must have the heart to change before we truly take the initiative to find out how to change wrong behavior. This is what it will take for any time of real change to occur over the long haul. If we don't see the importance of doing whatever it takes to get unhooked and make an unintentional shift in our thinking and our actions, we will eventually go back right to it. It is our prayer that this series has been a catalyst into getting some people closer to changing their minds and their hearts. When that happens, a lasting change is possible. So, dear listener, here are a few tips for those who do have the hearts to stop doing what is wrong. The first step is first say no to that which is trying to poison your mind and your marriage, and therefore it starts with a decision. Romans 8 verse 5 to 8 tells us, Those who live according to their sinful nature have their mind set on what that nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. In Romans 12 verse 1 to 2 he adds, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's perfect will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And he continues to say in Colossians 3, verse 2 to 5, Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you'll appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. So the second step is you take action and flee from that which you shouldn't be involved in. That's what the Bible tells us to do. You don't double in in it or fight it. You flee from it and find help so that you don't go back. First Corinthians 6 verse 18 to 20 says, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, who you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. 
So what God has created for good, human beings are distorting and prostituting. That which comes from God, for husband and wife to know each other more intimately, is becoming like a God to so many. Its temporal pleasures are driving people into a personal hell of sexual addiction and spiritual oppression. Flee from its grasp as you would flee from a poisonous snake. When you play with anything that even hints of immorality, you are playing with fire. It sears the conscience and scars the soul. That is what Gary Kinnaman says. When you read James 4, verse 7 to 10, it says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinner, and purify your hearts. You double-minded, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Do you get that, dear listener? Flee from sin. Don't keep playing with fire. It is a losing proposition. Flee from sin, submit to God, and you will be free. The next step is seek godly counsel and find accountability partner to help you in your fight against the gravitational pull towards that which violates marital sacredness. And if you are involved in pornography, here is another tip. Safeguard your computer. Don't put it in a room in which adults aren't around when it's in use. Put it in the family living area where there is in the privacy to view that which will usher in darkness. Figure out how to make the computer only accessible when others are present, and the same goes for the TV, that is, if that is a problem to you. And lastly, protect yourself and protect your family. If you need to put a lock on your computer or get rid of it completely, then do it. Hopefully, you can figure out another way. But if not, then do it. You see, you can't protect yourself against everything all the time. But the rule can be, as for me in my house and to the best of your ability outside of your house, we will honor the Lord. Psalm 101 says, I will set before my eyes no vile thing. That's a good rule for all of us, no matter who we are and where we are. Dear listener, I pray this has been helpful. Thank you for keeping it Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. We will be glad to receive your views, comments, and suggestions about this program. Send them to the producer, Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. Our email address is awrnairobi at eau.adventist.org. All things are ready. Come to the feast, come for the table now is spread. If a mission ye will recall, and thou shalt be richly fed.
are tuned into Adventist World Radio, The Voice of Hope, and I'm your presenter, Tileno Diambo. Let us now listen to Steve Rundu as he tells us about giving and the presence of the Lord. Stay tuned. Giving and God's Presence Our key text this day comes from the book of Leviticus chapter 9 verses 1 all the way to 24 I will although read excerpts of it Verses 1 On the eighth day Moses summoned Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel He said to Aaron Take a bull calf for your sin of offerings And a ram for your burnt offering Both without defect and present Present them before the Lord. Then say to the Israelites, Take a male goat for a sin offering, a calf and a lamb, both a year old and without defect, for a burnt offering, and an ox and a ram for a fellowship offering to sacrifice before the Lord, together with a grain offering mixed with oil. For today the Lord will appear to you. I will jump to verses 6. Then Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded you to do so that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Moses said to Aaron, Come to the altar and sacrifice your sin offering and your burnt offering and make atonement for yourself and the people. Sacrifice the offering that is for the people and make atonement for them also, as the Lord has commanded. I will go all the way to verse 12. Then he slaughtered the burnt offering, his sons handed him the blood, and he sprinkled it against the altar on all sides. They handed him the burnt offering, piece by piece, including the head, and he burned them on the altar. He washed the inner parts of the legs and burned them on top of the burnt offering on the altar. Verses 18, he said, He slaughtered the ox and the ram as the fellowship offering for the people. His son handed him the blood and he sprinkled it against the altar on all sides. But the fat portions of the ox and the ram the fat tail, the layer of fat, the kidneys and the covering of the liver. These they laid to the breasts. And then Aaron burned the fat on the altar. Verse 23 it says, Meeting Moses and Aaron then went into the tent of meeting. When they came out they blessed the people and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. See what happens when you give to the Lord offerings. He appears before you. His presence is with you. Now in the Old Testament, God's people met God and greeted Him through their first sacrifices. They made their offerings so that the glory of the Lord might appear to them. Mandatory sacrifices removed the negative space sin created between God and people, while the voluntary gifts initiated a positive encounter with God, who promised to respond with pleasure to free will offerings. We still make contact with God through our giving. The negative space has been removed by Christ's sacrifice, and Christians today meet God and experience His approval through our kindness to one another. See Hebrews 13, verse 16. Salvation not only reconciles us to God, but brings us into true fellowship with our brothers and sisters, especially as we grow in generosity. We can find this in Acts chapter 2, verses 44, all the way to 47, and also in chapter 4, 32 to 37. The church is God's family in the world. This, as it is pointed out by Pope Benedict's, the parable of the Good Samaritan remains as a standard 
which imposes universal love towards the needy who we encounter by chance. Whoever they may be, without in any way detracting from this commandment of universal love, the church also has a specific responsibility. Within the essential family, no member should suffer through being in need. The teaching of the letter to the Galatians is emphatic. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Terry A. Parker, Gregory L. Sperry, and David H. Wills of the National Christian Foundation know that the rewards God promises for such generosity are not those advocated by the so-called health and wealth gospel. But the return on investment he provides will far exceed anything this world can offer. It will include the unspeakable joy of his presence, now and forever. God takes pleasure in promising marvelous gifts to us, his children, commands Terry A. Parker. That's his nature. We learn to cherish his promises and seek his rewards, not simply because we want more from him, but because we desire more of him. Ultimately, God has his kingdom, and his kingdom are our treasure. God blesses us so that we can be a blessing to others. He does not give us more wealth primarily to increase our standard of living, but to increase our standard of giving. Let us think about these things as we think of starting to give so that we can be in the presence of God. When you give, do you feel closer to God or worried and concerned about your finances? Are you willing to risk more in giving just because you want to grow in your desire for God? What are some barriers that you perceive to giving on a regular basis? I will ask us to pray about these things so that we can start acting on our giving. If you do not give regularly, try and experiment giving. Give to your church or another organization regularly for one month. Then pray and ask the Holy Spirit to show you how this experiment has affected your relationship with God. If you already give regularly, try this. As you give during the next few weeks, be particularly mindful of how your giving affects your sense of God's presence in your life. Let us make a prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you even for the monies you've given unto us. No matter how much or how little we have, Lord, we appreciate and we acknowledge that it all comes from you. Father, we ask you to teach us how to be better givers so that we can give our offerings to you not because we want more, but because we want to be more close to you. Father, we appreciate that you bless us so that we can be a blessing to others. Lord, teach us how to give regularly, teach us how to give willingly, and teach us how to give so that we can be close to you. I pray and ask that the Holy Spirit will show me how to experiment on how giving affects my relationship with you. Lord, thank you for your love even when I didn't love you. Thank you for your support even when I did not ask for your support. Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. And I thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. I have prayed all this, trusting and believing in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hope that you have made your day wonderful. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of our program today. Feel free to send us your views, comments, and suggestions about this program by writing to the producer, Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. Our email address is awrnairobi at eau.adventist.org. I have been your host, Chileno Diambo, be blessed.